Hi everyone, thank you, Alex. Um, I share my screen right away so that we can look at documentation and code and demos. The first thing I want to say is there is a fundamental difference between uh, there are many types of memories, and this is a good, uh, simple but good way to talk about memory. So if you look at the kernel today, we have this object in the kernel that we call memory, and we really call it semantic memory, which is a way to store information and then search for, you can use it to search for similar information. Once after storing it, you can retrieve by similarity. And you can store whatever you want, but it's usually information, generic information. It could be a document, a chunk of a document, and things like that. We have a longer term vision about building a very functional memory that can emulate more than that. And like in particular, you can store facts, uh, what, what you can see here, these episodic memories. That they, those episodes or facts can be extracted from whatever content you provide. Let's say you let's say you ingest a document with a list of things you have done over the summer. You can extract from the document some episodes. Uh, we want to make that possible. And then there is a thing called implicit memory. It, this is molded around the human brain. There are things that you know explicitly and things that you know implicitly. You learn over time. And you can recognize these work skills, which is something that we have been using in the kernel. We're renaming it to plugins. But in our brain, we have this part where we memorize skills. We learn how to do things. Currently, skills are kind of, we have native skills and semantic skills, and they are kind of defined either with code or prompts. Um, I believe that over time, we will be able to teach AI those skills through conversations or observing information that we provide directly or indirectly. So longer, longer term with future models, I believe out of memory, we will also get these skills. But today we're moving into, we're still in the explicit space and we want to provide a solution that allows to ingest a lot of the information and answer questions. So if you look at the memory scale that we have in the kernel, it doesn't have an ask method. It has a um, recall method, which given a string retrieves a uh, similar string, similar content from the memory. In the new project, in this new repo, we have this new method called ask that given a question retrieves, returns an answer. Uh, the answer is now in the storage itself is generated on the fly. This is where we start talking about RAG and given several chunks of text extracted from documents or images or voice, given those chunks, you can generate an answer. So this is the very high level uh, description of the long-term vision of our memory. And talking about the memory uh, object that we have in this new repo, if somebody is familiar with his interface, which we call a high semantic memory client, it has a few methods to import data like documents or text or a web page. You can say load this web page into memory. Uh, there is this method, these two methods, search and ask, which used to have a, a filter. Uh, you could say when I'm searching my memory or when I'm asking a question, I want to yeah, there we are. I guess everybody's having it. Okay. So we can ground the generation of an answer on the entire set of your information or on specific data sets. And you can provide a filter. Now we have added the ability to provide more filters. So to, to explain this in a different way, in the, in the past, you could provide one filter with many tags, and it was it would translate into an end expression like tag one, end tag two, end tag three. Now we can provide a list, so we can combine end and or logic, and I get into those details. 
so we can provide more complex uh, filtering at the moment when we're searching for text or where we're asking for an answer. So we have this document in the repo. Let me switch to my browser here, which explains what filters are and why we introduce them. So the main reason for filters is security. And in particular, many customers are asking, how do I protect my data or, or user information from another user? And the, the quick way is to physically separate records. For example, if you're using Azure Cognitive Search or Pinecone, you can create multiple indexes or collections. They have different names. And you cannot query all of them. You, when you, at the time of querying, you have to specify, I'm sending this query to index one or index two, or index three, so you can map one index to a user. However, if you look at these, doesn't really scale well, depending on the engine that you select. For example, with Azure Cognitive Search, the number of indexes has an impact on the cost. And there is a limit of a, thousand, a few thousands at this time. It's going to change in the future and get better, so you can have an infinite number of indexes. But as of today, you can create a few thousand indexes. After that, you have to do another deployment, and it becomes hard to map the user to the index. And it's expensive. If you look at Pinecone, you get one index for free, then you start paying for the extra indexes, and creating an index can take several seconds. It used to take minutes. Uh, other engines like Quadrant, indexes are cheap, like you can create as many indexes as you want. So this idea of separating data by indexes can work, but it doesn't scale too much. And you might have a need for splitting data, not just by user, but by other um, dimensions, like by department, by type, or I don't know, by language and so forth. So we have added this concept of tags. And when you write data, now you can choose the index or you can leave the index parameter empty and you can pass some tags. And you can use tags to say whatever you like. You can say the user is five, the user is 15, the email address is this, the email address is another one. You can use GUIDs or you can add multiple values for the same tag. So, for example, you can say this memory record belongs to two users or five users. And, and so forth. So this is very flexible and kind of free. In many engines, you can add as this extra payload when you write a record, like a vector, you can attach extra information. So that's how we store tags. So to give you an example here, we're importing a document and then we're asking a question and the question will be generated, uh, the answer will be generated from the content of this file. We have the ability to say, OK, I want to store this file in this index. It's fine, it's easy. Or you can use tags. You can say, I want to import this document. I want to append a tag like user 333. And then I can filter my question on those tags. I can say, I can ask this question. It will be applied to the entire index, ignoring tags. Or you can say, I want to ground the answer to documents which have this tag. So at this point, you can see how you can split data by user. Like you might get a different answer if these two users have ingested different documents. And uh, you can combine indexes and tags, of course. So, so far, so good. This is kind of straightforward. Uh, just an example here, though. Um, in this case, you will get no answer. So by design, um, if data, uh, if you put data in one index and then you query without specifying the index, it will go to an index called default. Uh, in this case, the um, you get no answer for the same reason because the index is different, even if the tag matches. But in this case, you will get an answer because you're selecting the right index and the right user. And this as well will give you an answer because you're querying the entire index. Here I'm showing you how you can apply multiple tag, multiple values for the same tag. You, this is a way, for example, to say this record, these memories are accessible to multiple users. And um, you can query with a single user. You see, you get an answer. 
And this is more examples where you can say, I can use tags to specify the type. For example, I might have a bunch of documents about planning, a bunch of documents about blogs, other documents about chats. And you can ask filtering by those uh, tags. So from a security perspective, we recommend to always have a user tag. The name of the tag doesn't matter as long as you have a tag dedicated to the user identity. So always write data with a user tag and always query your data with a user tag. The memory, this new memory service does not do authentication for you. So currently it is designed to run as a private component that you deploy in your private network and you access that from your backend. Like you can think about this as a database that you should not expose to the public. You access the database from your application. So when you talk to your database, you have to filter, you have to write your own SQL, you have to write your own filters. And of course, use the proper authentication mechanism. We suggest Azure Active Directory, but there are many good ones. Usually work with JWT tokens, as long as they are signed, is good enough. You can extract the user ID from the token, and you can use that user ID as a filter. So this has been possible in the new memory component for a couple of months. Since yesterday, we actually, a couple of days ago, we have added now the ability to do more complex filtering. So you can say tailor, like the, the memory belongs to user one or user two, instead of user one and user two. And you can go more and more complex uh, queries like uh, reply to my question, looking at the news that belong to Taylor and the blogs that belong to Andrea. So you can all do all of these as long as you understand this new syntax. Uh, so in before we were using the filter parameter, we have these new filters parameter, which is a list of filters. Each filter, so this is a list, each entry is basically a list of conditions which are concatenated with the end logic. And then each item is concatenated with the other using the OR logic. So in this case, you have answer to my question, looking at memory that belongs to Taylor and looking at memories that belong to Andrea. So using the OR logic. So the memory can belong to one or the other. It doesn't need to belong to both. Then, of course, there is some confusion often depending on the language that you speak, what end translates to, to from lang natural language to code. For example, if I say reply using memories belonging to Taylor and Andrea, it can be confusing. <laughs> like, do you mean that it belongs to both or it can belong to one of the, the two? So you have to think about your application, what that really means. So the user requirement might be it needs to belong to both or it needs to belong to one of the two. So you have to choose whether to use a name or a node. Uh, like this is another example. Reply to my question using news belonging to Taylor and blogs belonging to Andrea. So here we have a type, we have an end. So usually it would translate to something like this. So the mem filter on my memory by user, it needs to belong to Taylor and Andrea, to both of them. It needs to be both a news and a blog. But you could also translate that sentence into something different like this, like filter my memories, select Taylor's memories, only the news, and then select also Andrea memories, but in this case, the blogs, and combine both of them. So here's where the or comes in. And you can see the difference. Here there is this list includes only one filter. This list includes two filters, and that's where the or comes in. So here there are more examples in the document, but I hope it makes sense how you can combine N and OR. The challenge here is that every engine, so we support it, we support Azure Cognitive Search, Quadrant, and a custom VectorDB that is stored on disk, very just for development purpose. Each of them has a different way, different syntax. So in uh, Azure Cognitive Search, you use O data. So we translate these into an O data expression that we pass to Azure Cognitive Search. With Quadrant, we use the must and should uh, conditions and they can be nested. So we had to spend some time to, to make sure that everything works. 
I just for to be 100 percent sure we have we started adding to the repo functional test so if you go and look on the test you will see here we have three test cases um test suite and you can see that we are testing we're creating a rec a bunch of records from a file and then we ask and uh, what we expect like not found or found what were not found and found are basically two strings so i would suggest for people interested in this topic read the document give us some feedback hopefully it's clear enough look at the test there should be sufficient information here to understand how you can play with filters and um, let us know if you need more advanced ways of querying your memories um, of course the more complexity the more we start getting into scenarios where a specific kind of query works only with a specific engine um, let's say you want to filter with a not or a XOR or things like that, we might say, oh, this works only with Quadrant. It doesn't work in another one or support. We might have to implement the same logic with code. So it start performing differently. But that's that's pretty much it. Uh, wondering if there's any questions or feedback.